I am 45 years old and have been married to Amy, a 45-year-old female, for the past 15 years. I work as an executive for a company while my wife is a housewife. She used to work at a plant nursery in her 20s but elected to stay at home when we married. We have two daughters, Emma, 13, and Ella, 11. Our family was blissful until the truth about my wife's adultery was revealed, thanks to the smart television. Okay, last week was our pal John's birthday. He has lived in a distant country for the past few years. We video called him at midnight for tuition, after wishing him all four of us. My wife and I, as well as John and his wife, were having informal discussions about work. He had no other arrangements for his birthday night, so we decided to hang out online and relax for a while. His wife proposed that we Chromecast the WhatsApp video call to the television. This allows us to sit back, relax, and have fun together. My friend's wife and Amy are also close friends, and we used to spend a lot of time together when they visited the city. Anyway, Amy connected her phone to the TV because the TV remote app was already installed and functioning on her device. We get some beers and food and join the virtual party. After a time, Amy became dizzy and fell asleep on the couch while John and I continued to talk. Around 15 to 20 minutes in, his wife also fell asleep. Due to internet fluctuations, the call was dropped and my wife's WhatsApp screen appeared on the television. I was ready to contact John back when I spotted over 10 unread messages from someone named Lifeline with a heart. I was slightly astonished because that was not me. Curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked on the profile photo to discover that it was her childhood friend Matt. I met him numerous times after my marriage because my wife was connected to him. They were neighbors and schoolmates. She once told me that everyone in their neighborhood and at school assumed they were dating or would date each other. However, that never occurred. My wife said she did not perceive him as a love partner. Furthermore, given his current situation, Matt had no interest in women. Matt was single. I wasn't too concerned about seeing my wife's lifeline because she told me he wasn't interested in women. However, just then, another message appeared from the chat head. Baby, I miss you. It prompted me to look into the topic. I hesitantly began Matt's chat session. When we were connected on the VC, I discovered that my wife had been conversing with him via her phone the entire time. Unfortunately, she fell asleep without kissing him goodnight. And that's why he blew up her WhatsApp when he saw the blue tick on his texts. His texts became like, Why aren't you responding? Is everything okay? I can't sleep without receiving your goodnight kiss. I can't get over today's session. OMG, you were so good today. This cannot be a chat between close friends. By that point, I was clear their connection had progressed beyond friendship. I scrolled off the chat and discovered that they sex virtually every night. OMG, what unclear discussions they had. My wife slept peacefully on the couch. I went through all of the garbage she shared with her lover friend. The talks included periodic glimpses of X-rated photographs and nakedness, which sent shivers down my spine. I was numb, but I needed to know what transpired between them. I didn't know how to take screenshots of these TV chats, so I used my phone to capture images of the screen. I was finished after four or five photos. I did not care about acquiring evidence. I wanted to know how and why. I wanted to yell, howl, and vent my rage. However, I didn't know how to confront her. It was 2 a.m. I was already down with many beers and a couple shots of scotch. I scarcely had the energy to walk or think. I just kept scrolling through the chat, my broken marriage in front of me on the large screen. At that point, everything appeared to be baseless. She shared every detail with her lover, even the details of our most intimate experiences. In fact, after each intimate time we shared, she would recreate it with him to make up for his feelings. I felt disgusted. I wanted to know when it all started. As a result, I continued scrolling, but it appeared to be a never-ending scene that just became deeper, even after reaching the deepest corner. Matt's communications had ended and the home was dead silent. I felt haunted. I grabbed a cushion from beside me to make sure I wasn't dreaming or hallucinating. I was still browsing lazily when Amy abruptly awoke from her slumber. Her sleepy mind suddenly became hyperactive on seeing her dual life on the TV screen. She grabbed the remote from my hand and turned off the television. She pounced on her phone, disconnecting it from the TV. I just stared at her, bewildered. I witnessed her open her WhatsApp conversation, scroll through her lover's communication, and then close the app with a big sigh. 
The lengthy sigh was a gesture of surrender. She recognized that I knew everything. She cradled my face with her hands and moved closer to me, saying, Baby, I can explain. Please listen to me. I returned her stare and said, Yes, please explain. She was astounded by my reaction. She was expecting me to overreact and refuse to listen to her. I would have done the same thing if it were 2.30 p.m. Instead of 2.30 a.m., I was on the verge of passing out, partially due to the booze and primarily due to the unraveling truth. Damn it, explain. She was at a loss for words. She mumbled. Well, I said, you know what? Do not try. You know you're screwed for saying this. I staggered my way into the bedroom. She followed me. I turned towards her and slammed the door in her face, telling her to keep out. I heard her knock a couple times, but I dropped out quickly. The next morning, I awoke heavy-headed and almost forgetful of what had transpired the night before. I went out of the room to get a bottle of water. My throat was dry. When she saw me go out of the room, she raced towards me, and with that sight, all of the horrible memories from the previous night came flooding back. She tried to hug me, but I ordered her to stop. She retreated, teary-eyed and puppy-faced. She explained that I misunderstood. I ignored her and headed to the refrigerator to get a water bottle. She kept nagging me that I was exaggerating, and he was only a buddy. They never had a physical relationship. It was only for talks. It was simply a good flirtation. I wasn't prepared for a confrontation yet, but her trite justifications irritated me, so I screamed louder. Really? Who? The Earth transmits nudes to male buddies. And what does sexting mean? Isn't he supposed to be uninterested in women? So... How the hell did he get interested in your private parts? It was Saturday morning and thankfully my children were not at home. They spent the week with my parents, enjoying their summer vacation. I looked at her and asked for an explanation. My mental state was pathetic. I wanted to get to the heart of the matter, although knowing it would shatter me. I wanted her to confess every detail of her crime, yet I wanted to throw up. When she opened her mouth, I grinded my teeth, begging her to speak, but then shut her up when she did. I don't know what I was doing. I realized I was unreasonable, but how else would someone react after discovering that he had been cheated for the last 15 years and that his entire marital life had been a sham? I drank the full bottle of water in one sitting and then threatened to pummel the dual-faced lover if she didn't reveal everything right away. Black and blue. This time, instead of concealing or pleading, she told the truth. She confessed that she and Matt had always been lovers. They started a physical relationship in high school and have kept it going ever since. However, Matt was a slacker who told Amy that he couldn't afford to provide for her. To provide some context, Matt is a school dropout who has never earned a penny on his own. His parents had purchased many decent residences in the suburbs. His rental yield is sufficient to cover his expenses. However, that is insufficient to support two people. During my visits to Amy's house, I had the opportunity to meet his parents several times. They were concerned about Matt's sloth and asked Amy for advice on getting a job or starting a business. Everyone but Matt was concerned about his future. Anyway, back on track. Amy admitted that she had broken up with Matt several times because of his commitment concerns. However, he was always able to win her back. Matt didn't seem to mind Amy dating other guys, despite the fact that he never dated anybody other than Amy. She had a handful of lovers before we started dating, so this rang real to me, albeit incredible. What type of lover would do that? I understand. Perhaps a lazy one. I questioned her why she hadn't married him if they were so close. She said that Matt would never have been able to provide her with a comfortable existence. Besides, Amy, too, has never had a stable job, nor has she ever aspired to be the breadwinner in the family. So she decided to be a freeloader and live a double life. I asked her one last question, if the girls were mine or Matt's. She swore they were mine. I was not convinced and continued to distrust her. If I was still not convinced, she offered to have a DNA test done. She stated that she could not risk having the children with Matt because she was afraid that if her reality was revealed and I abandoned the children, Matt would be unable to parent them even if he wanted to. I'm not sure whether I should be relieved that at least the children were mine. I asked her to leave the house or else I would divulge her secret to everyone, even the girls. They might be young, but they are intelligent enough to understand the reality. She begged me not to tell our girls, fearing they would despise and disdain her. 
I replenished the bottle of water, grabbed a few beer bottles, and entered my room to lock it. I sat in front of my laptop, staring at the screen for over an hour. I wasn't sure what to do next door. Who should I talk to? The truth was killing me from within. I felt suffocated. After I finished emptying the beer bottles, I left my room, got my car keys, and drove 30 minutes to my in-law's house. My mill answered the doorstep with a friendly grin, but when she saw my flushed face, she realized something was wrong. She summoned my Phil, who ran from their bedroom to sit me down. I was sweating and palpitating from nervousness. I told them that I didn't know any better way to deal with this while explaining everything. My throat became dry, and my body temperature skyrocketed as I conveyed the unpleasant truth. We heard someone knocking on the door about halfway through. It was Amy. She stormed into the house and told me to leave right now. She emphasized that this was our private business and that we should deal with it without involving her parents. The next few hours were filled with emotional wrath and agony. I confronted her for cheating on me for 15 years while she dismissed it as a casual relationship that meant nothing to her. She gradually transferred responsibility onto me for influencing her parents against her, and I defended myself. My in-laws agreed with me and berated her. I spent the entire weekend drinking, passing out, and filled my stomach with booze. The following day was Monday. I went to work feeling drowsy and fatigued. At the office, I looked up some divorce lawyers and scheduled an appointment with one. When I returned home, I discovered that several of her items had gone missing. I believe she came home while I was out, packed some of her belongings, and departed. I didn't bother checking on her. She messaged me, saying she'd be staying at a hotel to allow me some time to relax. Seriously, did she think the situation was so insignificant that I could just move on? She also sent me letters appealing for pardon and promising to quit her connection with her partner. It's been one week since that awful day. It's Friday again. The week passed too slowly for me. I suppose the weekend would be slower. I have an appointment with a lawyer on Monday. I've been reading a lot of Reddit tales trying to figure out how to solve my situation. But I suppose mine is a difficult case. More than me. I'm concerned about my girls. How can I deal with them? How do I confront them? Should I confront them at all? Update. Thank you for the great advice. I apologize for not updating you. However, I did communicate with a few of you via PM and comments. I know it's been six months since my first post, and let me tell you, it was a difficult road. On Monday, I visited with the lawyer to discuss my worries about my daughter's case. The lawyer recommended me to approach the children discreetly about the separation and avoid delving into the details, as they may experience mental stress. He also stated that because my wife is unemployed and given the nature of her affair, I have a decent chance of obtaining custody. On the same day, my parents contacted Amy to come pick up the kids from their residence. They were still not aware of the situation. She arrived home with the kids as I lay exhausted on the couch after a tense appointment with a lawyer. I refrained from conversing in front of the children and was confined to my room when she entered. I instructed her to face the females about her adultery. She sobbed and begged my pardon. She kept claiming that the girls would despise her for this. I suppose they should. She deserved to be loathed. What do you anticipate after 15 years of cheating on your family? The lawyer estimated that it would take about a week to mail the divorce papers to Amy, so I had a week to work things out with the children and my parents. I informed her I was divorcing her. She reacted as if this was a completely unexpected event. She stated that the divorce would be traumatic for the children. I wonder where her maternal sentiments have been hidden all these years. I maintained that my choice was permanent and gave her a week to confront the girls in whatever way she wanted, or I would tell them the truth. I grabbed my pillows and fell asleep on the bedroom couch. That entire week, I left the house early in the morning and returned late in the evening as the weekend approached. She moaned and cried all night, sometimes so intensely that I woke up. I felt sorrow for her. But how did she keep doing this for so long? What were her thoughts? That she'd never be caught. She would have had numerous opportunity to cut off her beloved. Nevertheless, she remained with him. Our intimate talk was about my insecurities, deep, dark secrets, and all she had revealed to her partner. How could I possibly have forgotten all of those? On Friday evening, she informed me that she had devised a strategy to confront the females. The following day, I nodded. On Saturday after breakfast, she informed the children that we had some news for them. 
She informed me that I had been transferred to a different nation and would be going out for a few years. I was stunned as my kid glanced at me. I questioned her sarcastically in front of the girls. Does this imply I have to leave the house? Right. She rolled her eyes and told me to shut talking. She answered, Well, if the house is too big for the three of us, we can move to my parents' house. We can subsequently find a smaller space. The girls were puzzled by this. They were young, but not so inexperienced that they didn't comprehend the game she was playing. My younger daughter told me that what she's saying doesn't make sense, yet the elder one's query is direct. Are you two getting divorced? I gave Amy a harsh look and asked her to tell the truth. She sighed and broke down. The girls looked to me for the solutions. I assured them that they were correct about our divorce. I explained that we no longer felt compatible with each other. My older daughter suggested that I might be having an affair, and that's why Amy was crying. She took her mother's hand and inquired if I was cheating on Amy. Instead of clearing the air, Amy hugged her with anticipation. The girls gave me a disdainful expression. I lost my mind for that manipulative woman. I was astounded to see how she turned the table around me. I told my daughters everything, how I found out and what their mother was up to. Of course, removing the A-plus content. Amy shouted at me for backing out of my statement. She told me that I allowed her the freedom to explain to the girls why I didn't support her when she informed them of my transfer. The matter had spiraled out of control, so I decided to stand firm against Amy's manipulative behavior. I called my parents and in-laws and begged them to come down immediately. Both of them reside 25 to 30 minutes away, and within an hour, all four of them had arrived at my place. That one hour was a nightmare for me, something I'll never forget. My girls cried as they hugged me and saw this. Amy tried to justify her conduct. She even went as far as calling me a liar and manipulating the girls against me. She finally stopped when I informed her that I had photographs of those discussions. My parents were surprised to find us in that state. I described the incident briefly. Everyone detested Amy for her wicked behavior. She kept sobbing and pleading for pardon. For a moment, I felt sorry for her. It saddens me, too, to see her in this state. But she brought it on herself. Instead of portraying me as the culprit in front of my girls, she could have just explained that we felt this way out of love or whatever. But she wasn't willing to accept even the smallest amount of responsibility. And now, her horrible truth is exposed in front of everyone, even her daughters. I made it plain that we are going through with the divorce and the girls will be with me. I requested her parents to take her away. Even the girls wanted her to leave. My parents chose to stay for a few weeks and care for us. It was a difficult moment for us, but we are delighted we came out strong. I enrolled all three of us in therapy and we are now in a much better mental space. My divorce proceedings are ongoing. Amy has claimed a part of my house, which I am contesting because she does not deserve anything. Surprisingly, she did not contest custody of the children allowing us to easily and clearly grasp her objectives throughout the battle. Even after that, Amy promised to cut off all contact with her lover. However, after moving in with her parents, she was discovered visiting her lover's home. Her siblings caught her and humiliated her to the point where she had to leave the house. Her parents embarrassed Matt and alerted his parents about his activities. The last I heard... Matt's parents had stopped paying all of his property leases and asked him to create his own living. I don't think about Amy as she works as a sales agent in a showroom. I'm focusing on raising my baby and giving her the best of everything. Wish me luck. Moving on to the next story. Story 2. Four-year-old son's questionable behavior at preschool revealed my wife's adultery. I caught her on a concealed camera and filed for divorce. A 32-year-old male have been married to my wife. 31 for four years, and between us we have a four-year-old boy. Our son is attending preschool. I work lengthy shifts as the major breadwinner. My wife is in between jobs because she did not enjoy her last career. At least she is home to care for our son. We were recently called into our son's preschool. They claimed that he began engaging in inappropriate behavior around three weeks ago, attempting to kiss ladies, lift their skirts, and touch their buttocks. My wife and I were flabbergasted. We couldn't explain it because I'm constantly careful of never behaving that way around my child. We are quite particular about the programs he is allowed to watch, and he is always accompanied by a parent when he visits or goes on playdates. 
As far as I knew, the only other place he could have gotten such weird beliefs was from school. The teachers couldn't explain it either, especially because he was the only one behaving that way. As a result, they were persuaded that he had been exposed to such behavior at home. They had also done their part by talking to him, but it was evident that they needed parental voices to support it. We discussed it with our son and decided to seek help if the conduct persisted. I couldn't shake the discovery, so I decided to have a man-to-man -man conversation with my son to figure out what had caused it. I waited until my wife was gone before asking him about his actions and his innocent innocence. He explained to me that the uncle who came over while I was at work done it to his mother, and she had never chastised him in his four-year-old thinking. He assumed that meant it was fine. His confession piqued my interest. It sounded like an affair, so I asked him some questions. How often does the uncle come over? Most days. What do they do with mom? Kiss, giggle, and whisper? How long does he stay here? Until I'm going to return from work. I was infuriated. I was working long hours to support our family and rarely getting enough sleep. Meanwhile, she was spending all of her time cheating on me rather than seeking for a new career or being more present with our son. I intend to catch her in the act. So I devised a strategy for my plan. I faced a trip to see my parents with my son. I promised her we'd stay for a few days to free up her schedule, as she'd been our son's primary caregiver since she lost her job. She did not object or suspect anything. So I packed up and pretended that this vacation was an actual occurrence. I had a camera in the living room and left with my son because I had no intention of visiting my parents. I visited my brother, who lives nearby. A few hours after we departed, our automobile drew up outside our house, and the man got out, utilizing the camera in the living room. I watched as my wife and the man began making out in the living room. I was enraged beyond belief, saddened for my family, and devastated for my son. I captured the video and forwarded it to her parents, brother, and other close relatives. They all called me in a fit. Some of them opted to act ignorant and asked me what was going on. Someone had made a bogus video or whatever. Her parents contacted and urged me to forgive the entire situation and attempt to reconcile with her. They argued that they had not reared their daughter in that manner and that there had to be a plausible explanation for what had occurred. They went on to add that they would speak with her directly and get to the bottom of things. Her brother, on the other hand, was understandably upset with her. He claimed he was horrified by her conduct and would support whatever course of action I selected. My wife also called after seeing the video and began sobbing and pleading for forgiveness. She stated she had been seduced and lacked the willpower to resist, but she had realized her mistake and did not want to lose her family. She insisted on doing whatever to get back into my good graces. By that point, I was done with the relationship. I was disappointed that I had missed all of the warning flags and that they were acting behind my back in a house I had paid for. Even worse, they had subjected my four-year-old kid to same behavior. I decided to separate from her, so I asked her to leave the house, which I paid for and maintained. It was only fair. I also informed her that we were done. I didn't want to be in a relationship with someone who would lie to and mistreat me. She refused to go and refused to acknowledge that we were finished. She insisted that we could work things out, if only for the sake of our son. I informed her that if she did not leave peacefully, I would have to call the authorities and she would never see her son again. That made her come to her senses. She finally departed. I filed for divorce through a mediator. I planned to keep the house in the car. We had previously kept our funds separate, and I negotiated no alimony because of the circumstances that had led to the breakdown of our marriage, and I would battle for at least half or more custody. I have no objections to co-parenting, and I will thoroughly oversee what my child is exposed to. I plan to use her acts against her in the divorce to obtain what I want, and my attorney says the ball is in my court. I can't wait to get through this nightmare and go on with my life. Here is the next story. I am a 30-year-old female who was meant to marry my ex fiance Scott, 32, five years ago, but that did not happen. Scott and I had been together for approximately two years before he proposed, and I said yes. On the day of our wedding, he abandoned me for his ex-girlfriend, Ruby Ruby, 32 years old female, then came six months of planning, culminating in our wedding day. So we were together for two and a half years. He did, however, change his mind about the wedding at the last minute when Ruby arrived. 
And no, I did not invite her, and she was not on the approved guest list. She was added by my beloved mother-in-law, Alice. Ruby and Scott had been dating for seven years, but had split up for two years when we started dating. He didn't say much about her, and I learned the cause for their breakup from his friends. They had started dating when they were 18 years old in their senior year and had remained together throughout college. Ruby attended college out of state after graduation and later returned. They moved in together and lived in an apartment for over seven years before Scott asked her to marry him. Unfortunately, Ruby was not ready and turned him down. They attempted to salvage the relationship after that, but it simply did not work. They eventually separated ways. Ruby even accepted a job in Canada to get out of the city. That was it. They also lost touch following their separation. I went to the same college as Scott, although I was his junior and didn't communicate with him much. I met Scott again at a co-worker's Christmas dinner and felt a connection there, so we ended up leaving the party after a while and going out on our own. We spent a great day together and agreed to stay in touch. We went on a few dates, and within three months we were in a proper relationship. We dated for two years before deciding to marry, but it was all for naught when Ruby showed up on our purported wedding day over three years after their separation. Everything is still as vivid to me as the day it happened. I'd already walked down the aisle and we were up on the podium when he admitted that because we were in a chapel, he couldn't bring himself to lie and needed to talk to me about something very important. So we paused the ceremony and he drew me away to tell me that his mother had invited Ruby to the wedding, even pointing them out to me. Alice and Ruby were seated in the front row, Alice looking smug as hell in her off-white outfit. I mean, she had worn something close to white to my wedding, and Ruby was looking down at her feet. I wasn't shocked Alice had invited Scott's ex to disrupt the wedding because she had made it clear from the start of our relationship that she didn't like me at all. It was undoubtedly because I am not the type of daughter-in-law she desired. I'm not a soft speaker. I am not what you would call sweet or timid. So I'm not the ideal daughter-in-law, according to Alice. Not that they are horrible attributes, but I didn't have any of them. I was always too loud, aggressive, or overly outspoken for her tastes. So, of course, she brought someone she thought was a better fit for their family than I was. So she went ahead and invited the better daughter-in-law to the wedding so that she could better control and manipulate her son in the future. Not only did she bring her, but she also arranged for Ruby and Scott to have a chat before I walked down the aisle, which he later told me about, using the conversation as an excuse to dump me at the altar. He told me that he and Ruby spoke before this, and she apologized for turning him down all those years ago, explaining that she was simply too young and inexperienced to make such a significant commitment. But now, over three years later, she realized she'd made a mistake since she knew she'd never find someone better than him, and she'd returned to plead for one more chance to salvage their relationship. That was all it took to erase two years of our relationship, and he was back at square one again. Obviously, I attempted to argue with him and persuade him to stay, but he informed me that getting married would be a mistake now that he recognized he had never truly fallen out of love with Ruby, and I was merely a stand-in for the lady he truly loved. His remarks stung, but I was desperate and attempted to persuade him to stay. Nonetheless, it did not work, and I realized that it was all for naught when he asked me to return my engagement ring. I lost my calm and threw it on the ground before walking out and driving myself away from the wedding. All of the guests and anything related to Scott. I kept driving till I arrived at the B, which was a bit outside of town, and I stayed there for a few days. Scott paid off all of the wedding organizers and vendors' fees, and happily, I didn't have to spend any of my hard-earned money on anything other than my outfit. The only time we met after that was when I returned home to collect my belongings after nearly two weeks at the wedding. He and Ruby were at home at the time, and they didn't even stop hugging when I stepped in with a friend to pack up my belongings and depart. That is how bad they were. And at the end of the day, I was delighted Scott decided to dump me before we got married, because we'd have to divorce anyhow. Whatever. Ruby decided she wanted him back, so they did save me a lot of money and anguish. I've attempted to move on, and I think I've done a good job of it, but I'm having serious trust issues now. I developed a nicotine addiction a few years ago, which was accompanied by debilitating despair, and I now need to attend treatment twice a week in order to function normally. My mental health has suffered greatly as a result of those three, although they appear to be doing well. 
They married a few months after I was dumped, and they now have two kids, ages two and four. They predict a third as well. According to what I know, I learned all of this after becoming friends with Ella Tate, the new receptionist at my workplace around six months ago. We met at a work party and realized we had a lot in common, so we became pretty good friends. One day at lunch, she informed me that one of the guys she hooked up with a few years ago and still followed on social media was having a third child with his wife. I assumed it was just harmless chatter, but she gave me the profile and it was Scott. I was taken aback for a few moments, but Ella went on to explain that she had matched with this guy on a dating app two years ago, and he had informed her that he was in an open marriage, so she consented to go out with him. But she was no longer sure if he had told her the truth, so I clarified and told her that he most likely wasn't in an open marriage and had been cheating on his wife because she was pregnant, since the period coincided with Ruby's second pregnancy. I explained my relationship with Scott to her, and we went through his and her social media profiles, which was simple because both of them had public accounts, and confirmed that they had been together when Ruby was heavily pregnant. I couldn't believe that this person had first abandoned me at the altar for Ruby, and now he couldn't even find it in himself to be true to the lady he had left me for. I was disgusted and felt it was time to get revenge at him for what he had done to me. And happily, Ella was a wonderful friend by then, and she consented to be a part of my scheme despite how messed up she had discovered. Scott's activities shall be. She was furious that he lied to her about being in an open marriage merely to entice her to sleep with him. They did not only hook up a few times, it lasted several weeks after their first few dates. She had followed him on Instagram and discovered that his wife was substantially pregnant, so she confronted him. But he informed her Ruby didn't care because she'd been with quite a few guys. During the first months of her pregnancy, Ella continued to hook up with him. But she finally realized she didn't want to play around with Scott anymore, since she'd developed feelings for him despite the fact that she'd only intended for it to be a pointless fling. They'd text frequently, and he'd flirt with her all the time, but she'd do her best to ignore it because she knew it wouldn't go anywhere because he was already married. And even if it was an open marriage, he would never abandon his wife for a woman he found on a dating app. As a result, they eventually drifted apart, although they remained socially connected. When I learned how Ella and Scott met, Ruby was already four months pregnant, and Scott had announced it on social media with a post. That's what Ella had shown me. After we discovered the connection, Ella and I began compiling all of the evidence we had of Scott's infidelity. It took a few days, but we eventually had a collection of screenshots of text messages Scott sent to Ella throughout their brief relationship. He used to flirt with her like it was nobody's business, making promises to her and all that crap. There were additional screenshots of him making plans to meet Ella, and he'd even invited her over to his house while Ruby was sleeping. She's a heavy sleeper who doesn't wake up for hours. I was disgusted and repulsed that he was doing this behind her back, especially since she was carrying his second kid. But that, Scott, is for you. Ella then had the idea to raise the bar even higher. I believe we made a mistake here. The two of us got way too caught up in the retribution, and I believe we went a bit insane when Ruby had six months. Ella and I thought it was time to put Scott to the test again, so Ella reached out to him again. We had no idea what to anticipate because they hadn't really been friends since they stopped talking two years ago. But Scott still said, and guess what? He was still flirting with Ella and reminiscing about their past since Ruby was pregnant again, and this time she was moodier and bigger than before. He told Ella that she had chosen the best time to contact him, implying that he was eager to cheat on Ruby again. We texted him for a few days, took a few more screenshots, and then left him hanging. Finally, two weeks ago, Scott announced that Ruby had given birth to a girl, and within three days, Ella and I shared all of the proof we had on Facebook and tagged everyone who knew the two of them. And that sparked a complete social media meltdown. But I turned off notifications for that post and waited for Scott or Ruby to contact me or Ella. It finally happened two days after we posted and Scott was the one to contact me. I blocked him everywhere after we split up five years ago, but I unblocked him simply to see what he thought about me finally exposing him for the jerk that he is. He texted me a lengthy diatribe about how I had ruined his life and how Ruby was now threatening to leave him simply because of what Ella and I had posted. 
He accused me of being a lunatic stalker and threatened to take me to court if Ruby divorced him, which is impossible given that he has no case against either me or Ella. He's the one who cheated once and then attempted to cheat again, brazenly. He yelled a lot of other things, but the majority of them were name-calling and accusing me of ruining his life. I was really pleased with what I had done because, from what I gathered, he would soon face a divorce and possibly a custody battle as well. And he deserved everything, in my opinion. Unfortunately, my buddies do not share the same sentiment. They believe I went too far, especially because Ruby was pregnant and it had been five years since our breakup. I should have just let sleeping dogs lie instead of doing some stupid stunt on social media for retribution as if we were still in high school. I don't think that's fair because Scott's actions wrecked any future connection I could have had. He dumped me at the altar for his ex-girlfriend after we had dated for two years, and I don't think any of my friends understand how terrible that felt. I spent years trying to move on, and I believe I was completely normal for a while until I met Ella, who informed me that Scott was cheating, and it is what pushed me over the brink. He had abandoned me for Ruby, and now he was not even loyal to her. But for whatever reason, my friends believed that I was the one who messed up here and thought that I owed them both an apology for trying to ruin their marriage after five years. I don't see how I damaged their marriage because all I did was put the facts out in public. The cheating was all on Scott, not me. Ella doesn't think we did anything wrong. But of course, she'd say that because she was a part of this as well. I don't understand how I'm in the wrong here. So either for exposing my ex-fiancé for cheating on his pregnant wife twice in a row after he left me at the altar five years ago. Update 1. Hi. So I decided not to apologize because after reading through most of the comments on my original post, I realized that I was doubting myself over something pretty ridiculous. Scott abandoned me at the altar five years ago to be with Ruby, and then he lied to Ella about being in an open marriage while Ruby was heavily pregnant just to hook up with her. I just exposed him for what he was doing. Yeah, I chose to do it at a time. That would be the most hurtful for both Ruby and Scott. But that's because they chose to hurt me five years back, too. So why shouldn't I try to get back at them? I tried being the bigger person and have let it all go, but the universe brought me back into his life some way or the other, just not for a good reason. I don't think I did anything wrong. And if anything, my friends should be talking about Scott being the bad guy instead of putting me down. But I don't think that's ever going to happen because my friends continued to remain friends with him even after he broke up with me on the day of our wedding. So that should have been enough for me to realize that these people never were my friends in the first place. But I guess I was too delusional to believe it at the time. I get it now, though, and have decided to cut them all off. I don't need them, and I'm quite sure I'm better off without such negative people in my life anyway. As for Ella, there was an unprecedented amount of hate for her because of the things she'd done, and I'd just like to take a moment to explain that she didn't have any idea that Scott wasn't in an open marriage back when she'd been going out with him. He'd convinced her that he was in an open marriage, and at that point he had very few pictures of Ruby on his profile. So it wasn't that hard for her to believe him. Trust me when I say this, she's really not the kind of woman who would hook up with a married man unless she knew that their partner had agreed to it. She's adventurous, but that doesn't make her immoral or whatever. The one thing that I'll concede she did wrong was that she didn't tell Ruby when she started suspecting that maybe Scott wasn't telling the truth about being in an open marriage. But she was too skeptical to talk about it to a woman she barely even knew, and a pregnant woman at that so she decided to remove herself from the situation entirely and stop talking to Scott. She's been a good friend to me, and I think even if she had messed up back then, I don't think I'm going to judge her by that because she's genuinely been there for me. So maybe I'm a little biased in her favor. Nobody's perfect, but we're all trying. And Ella is actually a nice person, so please don't just judge her based on the original post. There's a lot more to her as a person. I can promise you that. Now, coming to Scott and Ruby, from what I've heard... They're still fighting, and Ruby has actually been living with her parents for a few days. I still have two friends who are actually on my side, and they're keeping me in the loop since they have some friends in common with Ruby. It's been a week since my original post, and they still haven't managed to resolve the situation. As far as I know, if Ruby has even an ounce of dignity left, she'll walk out of that marriage just like I walked out of my wedding. But you never know.
These are pretty messed up people that we're talking about here, so there's no telling what they might or might not do. But I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to sit back, relax, and enjoy the drama with popcorn now. Update 2, super quick update. Okay, so you guys remember Alice, right? Alice, my almost mother-in-law, actually arranged the conversation between Scott and Ruby, which ended up destroying my relationship. Yeah, her. Today, Alice contacted me and she was nice to me today, which made sense because she wanted me to help her out by deleting the post I made. She got a hold of my number from Scott and called me to ask me, in her most tearful voice, to delete the post and talk to Ruby so that she'd come back to him because she couldn't afford to lose her three grandchildren. Ruby's furious and has been threatening to file for divorce and full custody of the kids with no visitation rights, and the only way to avoid that is if Scott agrees to transfer the ownership of their house to her. I don't understand why Scott isn't willing to do something so easy, and I'm not even going to try and understand why Ruby is still willing to stay no matter what conditions she puts forth. It's just crazy. But I'm not interested in being part of this craziness, so I told Alice that while I'd love to help the people who ruined my life and mental health, I just don't think there's any point in deleting the post because everyone knows the truth now. And I'd never speak to Ruby, not even if I was offered $10,000, because that's the woman who had no shame meddling in a relationship, but is now mad that someone else did the same thing to her. She should have known better, and she should have known that if Scott could be shallow enough to dump me in a single day just because she was back, he wouldn't hesitate before dumping her for someone else either. Anyway, I told Alice that I wasn't going to lift even a finger to help them out, and they could figure this one out on their own which is what they'd left me to do after I got dumped on what was supposed to be the happiest day of my life. It was so incredibly satisfying to disconnect the call in the middle of her sentence and then block her to make sure she couldn't contact me anymore. I don't care what people say. Honestly, a lot of folks here and even in the real world have said that I'm living in the past, but this feels like I'm finally getting closure, and I can actually start to move on from Scott, Ruby, and Alice now. Update 3. Hey, everyone. So it's been almost a month since I last posted an update. I've been busy with work because I just started working on a new project, and it's been kind of stressful, so I forgot about this post. If I'm being honest, there's not much to say, honestly, because after I told Alice that I wasn't taking the post down, they didn't contact me any further. What I do know, however, is that now Scott and Ruby are getting divorced and are fighting over who gets to keep the house in the settlement. They're also in a custody battle because apparently Ruby had demanded full custody of her kids with child support and only supervised visits once a month. Ella and I have had a good laugh over this because the guy really has nobody else to blame at this point apart from himself. Obviously, he had every chance to wake up and become a decent guy after he left me and fully committed to Ruby, which shouldn't have been hard because they dated for seven years already. I'm guessing he cheated on her then as well. So this is probably nothing new for him. Come to think of it, he must have cheated on two, but I never found out about it. This just proves that life always does come full circle because they're the ones suffering now. And I'm the one doing way better than I was in every aspect, mentally, physically, and definitely financially. I did what I had to do and I got my closure. I'm going to wish them nothing but good luck for the future. Now because I think that they're going to need it. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a story to tell about your or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.